Ice baths are whole body cryotherapy for recovery following endurance events. Welcome to the Science of Getting Faster podcast, where we cut through the headlines, talk directly to the researchers to find out what their studies suggest, what they don't, and where their research is headed. With us on the podcast today, we have Dr. Wilson. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Wilson. Hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Um, Today on the podcast, uh, we're going to be talking about cryotherapy in general. Then we're going to dive into one of Dr. Wilson's studies, uh, comparing whole body cryotherapy and ice baths. And then finally, we're going to dive into some of your questions. So Dr. Wilson, could you start by telling us what is cryotherapy? Of course. Yep. So Cryotherapy is a term that is used to cover a whole range of different treatments and different treatment types. But essentially, if you break the word down into its component parts, cryo just means cold. And obviously therapy, we're hoping it's going to bring about some kind of beneficial or therapeutic effect. So it's any kind of cold application for recovery or healing or um, any kind of beneficial outcome. And that can be Anything as simple as using an ice pack. So, you know, when you're a kid at school and you fall over and scrape your knee, you get an ice pack or a cold compress, or that can be a slightly more technologically advanced and use things like ice baths, whole body cryotherapy chambers, cryo cabins, or even cold water swimming can be referred to as cryotherapy. Yeah, and we've all seen, um, whether it be on YouTube or, and actually Jonathan um, had done, uh, or another Trainer Road employee who does the other uh, podcast, had done a YouTube video going into a cryotherapy chamber. So we see these people going in with hats and gloves and little clothing. Um, what, what does that involve? So, yeah, the idea is then you're trying to expose the skin and as much of the skin as possible to these cold temperatures. So depending on which treatment method you use, as you said, cryotherapy chambers, they almost look like completely enclosed shower cubicles. So for anyone who's not seen one before, you essentially step into this relatively small room. They tend to have glass doors. And the idea is you then pump in really, really super cold air. So anything down to kind of minus 120 degrees Celsius. And the idea is that you expose as much of the skin as possible. So you have to wear a hat, gloves, you wear a mask to cover your nose and mouth. Uh, So you protect your extremities and you protect as far as possible any of the bits in your face that have all the moisture because you don't want them to freeze. Um, And then you spend, you know, a couple of minutes walking around in that chamber. And the idea is it will bring about some kind of therapeutic benefit. Yeah. And how typically how long do you stay in there for? So it very much depends on the temperature. So with the different kinds of cryotherapy treatment, the general rule of thumb is the colder the temperature, the less time you want to spend in that environment. And that's obviously to try and protect against any negative side effects. So any kind of um, cold burns or problems with the skin. So in the cryotherapy chambers, the whole body cryotherapy chambers where you're in and you're completely surrounded by that cold air, treatments are normally anywhere between kind of two and four minutes Whereas if you're doing something like cold water immersion, you might find that the immersion time is a little bit longer because you can tolerate that slightly increased temperature, although it's still cold. It's not as cold as that minus 120 degrees that you get in a chamber. Wow. So minus 120 degrees. And then how does that compare to the cold water immersion, the ice baths? How cold would that typically be? So normally cold water immersion is recommended to... um, be applied anywhere between 10 and 15 degrees. And again, same rules apply. The the lower the temperature you have, generally the shorter the treatment time. So often we say 10 to 15 degrees for 10 to 15 minutes. So the 10 degrees, you might be looking at the 10 minute end of the range and the 15 degrees, you would probably be comfortable to sit for a little bit longer and you might have that 15 minutes in that temperature. Yeah, it's hard to conceptualise what 10 to 15 degrees Um, feels like or how we achieve that is that typically if you add ice to cold water will you achieve those temperatures so that depends on a number of different factors so um, some people might have seen some of the documentaries that you know follow sports teams or particular athletes who have utilized cryotherapy um you know seeing people use it after events out in the field you know real life you know, end of a Tour de France stage, for example, or end of a weightlifting competition, you might see someone jump in a bath. 
And it depends on, for one, what temperature the water is when it comes out of your pipes. So depending on the time of year and where you are in the world, you might find there's quite a range in that. It will be cool to the touch if you run it long enough, hopefully, but it might not be cold enough for ice bath temperatures. Um, Some people are a little bit less um, technical about how cold it gets. They'll just chuck ice in and if it feels cold, that'll do. You know, that's enough. Um, But you can get specially built units where you will actually have um, a chiller and a pump attached to a bath and you can then set the temperature so you can much more closely regulate the temperature you want to keep it at. And then you can also adjust if you want those small alterations for whatever reason in your temperature. Okay. If you don't have those temperature um, or a thermometer to be able to check those temperatures, um, is there a feeling that we should be aware of that is like you've gone beyond what you need to do or how do we know if we're we're doing too much or um too little so I think that's that's potentially a tricky one to answer and again without sounding like I'm ducking the question it will depend on a couple of different factors so um I've done cold water immersion treatment before um And I found it relatively uncomfortable initially. So you get in and it does take your breath away when you start. And that was at 10 degrees. So again, some people might go down to kind of eight degrees. There are some that will even go down to five, four degrees if we're talking cold water swimming. Um, So there isn't necessarily a way to know exactly what that temperature is, but it also depends on how regularly you do that kind of intervention. So for someone who has never done cold water immersion or cryotherapy before, they might find that initial immersion feels much colder compared to someone else's expectation or response if they've maybe done it regularly for a little while. Um, You do become accustomed to that cold. So over time, you will not necessarily get the same perceptual response if you are using it um, as a chronic intervention. So one thing I will say is if you want to have an idea, yes, you might not have access to the fancy kit and equipment, but even something as simple as getting yourself a garden thermometer, um, or we've had it before where people have monitors for baby baths, for example, where you can have a sensor in the water, something like that you can pop in the side, you can stick it to the side of the bath, assuming it's waterproof. And that should give you a good idea of what kind of temperature you're reaching after chucking in all the ice out of your freezer. Yeah, we've obviously all of us have seen like you said like documentaries with teams doing ice baths and such but it seems that whole body cryotherapy is more of an emerging um method why is there a difference or what why are we seeing an uptick in people being interested in the whole body cryotherapy Um, I think that you're absolutely right. There has been an increase in attention and focus and use on the whole body cryotherapy. Um, Any kind of cryotherapy that isn't whole body cryotherapy, we can then call partial body cryotherapy. So cold water immersion would come under that. Um, Some of the cryo cabins that you might have heard talked about um, often come under that. And the difference is essentially that in whole body cryotherapy, as the name suggests, your entire body is exposed to the cold, whereas in partial, it's most of the body normally. Um, For cold water immersion, obviously you will never have your head fully submerged, so your head will nearly always be out of the water. But equally, you can then adjust the depth of that water. So some people might do immersion right up to the neck, or you might find that if they've been focusing on lower body exercise, they might only submerge themselves maybe up to their waist. Um, The idea with the whole body cryotherapy chambers is that you can obviously then treat a much bigger surface area at one time, Um, much more so than if we go back to the more traditional older methods of things like ice packs. You know, that's a very um, limited area that you can treat in one go, whereas with a whole body cryotherapy chamber, you can do it all in one go. So in that sense, it's potentially more time efficient. Another thing I think is that it looks really fancy and I think that's quite a draw. You know, it's, it's marketed as this very new, very novel technique and very novel approach. And in that sense, it is still fairly inaccessible to a lot of people. So as you said, we see it being used in top flight clubs and teams used by elite individuals who maybe have more access to those kinds of facilities. So I think there is an aspect of novelty with it that is um, quite a draw that people are interested in. They want to try it. You know, it's something they've maybe not done before. So I think that has helped to popularise the idea, at least, of using whole body cryotherapy instead of maybe some of the more accessible or cheaper options that are available. And that makes your question 
the more important, I suppose, because if people are going to be spending money, um, it's worth knowing whether it's worth it. Um, but what are the what like physiological um, response are we hoping to have with the cryotherapy? So there are a number of different theories or mechanisms that have been discussed in the literature and examined to try and understand how and why cryotherapy works. So as I said, any cryotherapy intervention, irrespective of the modality, is based on the idea that we can reduce temperature. So whether that's skin temperature, muscle temperature or core temperature or all three, and that that will then have some kind of benefit. So one of the big ones that's talked about a lot is um, a reduction of the inflammatory response. So when you exercise, um, and particularly if you exercise at a very high intensity or you participate in some kind of novel exercise, something you've not done before, you will experience some level of exercise-induced muscle damage or EIMD. That can come about in a couple of different ways. We can talk about the more mechanical aspects of that, so structural damage to the force-generating parts of the muscle, for example. And we also have metabolic damage. So when maybe you get increases in temperature and you get a really rapid turnover of substrate for energy metabolism, for example, irrespective of where it comes from, that uh, process of damage then starts this whole cascade of other things within the muscle. So inflammation is one of those that is um, a very, very fast acting response. And what we can do with the use of cryotherapy for one is um, we can moderate blood flow to some of the more superficial tissues so the idea is that um, as you probably know if you go into a cold environment you start to find that you know your ends your fingers might start to turn a little bit more pale and that's because all of the vessels will start to constrict and you're trying to conserve heat so your body will um, shunt your blood volume back towards the center where it's nice and warm and you'll try and maintain heat So when we do um, any kind of cryotherapy, and again, depending on what part of the body or how much of the body you submerge or expose to that cold environment, you will get um, vasoconstriction in the superficial tissues and potentially um, in the muscle, depending on how long you are exposed to that cold temperature. What that means is if you decrease blood flow, at least for the short term, you decrease the potential for those inflammatory uh, metabolites to move to the area of damage or injury at the muscle. So if you reduce the inflammation response, you reduce swelling. And what that means is you can then potentially reduce soreness. So soreness is one of the most commonly talked about symptoms of EIMD. It's not necessarily one of the most detrimental, but it's the one probably nearly everybody is familiar with. That feeling, you know, in the days after exercise where you start to feel a little bit achy, maybe your legs feel a little bit stiff or tired. Um, And that soreness often comes about firstly as a result of the structural damage itself. You have made these tiny little micro tears in the muscle, but it might also be because there's a huge amount of fluid that's gone to that area to try and fix the problem, if you like. So you end up getting this, this swelling and this inflammatory response. So the idea behind the cryotherapy application is that if you can minimise that inflammatory response, it will uh, result in a lesser movement of blood and extracellular fluid to that area. And the idea then that that will result in less soreness, less stiffness, and also a reduction in the changing range of motion that you might expect to see after exercise as well. Yeah, so what role, or if there is any role, does inflammation play a role in long-term adaptations to exercise? Yeah, absolutely. So any kind of recovery intervention um, that you put in place is going to do one of two things. It's either going to um, accelerate natural processes to try and um, enhance recovery, or it's going to try and diminish or attenuate what we might perceive as negative consequences of exercise to try and shorten that recovery period. So in terms of inflammation, inflammation is actually a really, really key step in the process of muscle uh, muscle adaptation and repair. And um, because of that, it's a really, really important process in terms of performance adaptation and performance changes over time. So one of the big questions um, that's been investigated in the literature in terms of the use of cryotherapy, if we're trying to dampen that natural inflammatory response, if we're trying to minimise inflammation after exercise, in the short term, that might be a really good thing, but potentially in the longer term, that might not be beneficial depending on what your performance goal is in the longer term. 
Yeah, so it might be a question of where it's placed within your training cycle or competition um, phase. I also, this might be coming from, in fact, it's coming from a very simplistic understanding, but the if you're minimizing or limiting blood flow, are you also limiting nutrient delivery then? Yeah, so anything that is reliant on blood flow um, is going to be affected if you then alter blood flow, obviously. So if we're talking about um, delivery of nutrient to the muscle, so it, you know people often talk about post-exercise um, nutritional intake and you know the importance of that window after exercise to get nutrition on board. The ability to deliver those nutrients to the muscle will be diminished or limited slightly if we are successful in altering blood flow. So again, all of these um, mechanisms have the potential to be double-edged swords. So reducing blood flow, great, we reduce inflammation. But also, what does that mean? Well, it actually means we're going to reduce oxygen delivery as well. We're going to reduce nutrient delivery. Uh, we're going to reduce the ability to remove the metabolites in the muscle that we don't want anymore, any damaged bits of tissue. You know, that the idea that you get this influx of fluid, that helps to clear out that muscle and get rid of any, you know, little bits of muscle fibre that have become broken or damaged or aren't used anymore. So that would be the negative consequence of limiting that blood flow and ultimately limiting that inflammatory response. Yeah. And do you see athletes using it as an anal analgesic? That, did I say that correctly? A numbing yeah. um, tool? Yeah. So I've not been aware of athletes using it specifically for numbing. Um, obviously, it's something that's used a lot in terms of injury. So acute injury, and I don't mean by that you know, the tiny microstructure injury of EIMD. I'm talking more about, you know, you roll an ankle or you, you do something a little bit more dramatic during your training. That would be when you would ice. And the idea with that is that actually the cold sensation in terms of messages to your brain, the cold sensation overrides the pain sensation. So the way that that um, information is transmitted to your brain means that the application of cold helps dull the sensation of pain. So that can be a really, really good thing, obviously, if we're experiencing you know, an injury as a result of our training or something's gone horribly wrong in an event. But in terms of people using cold water immersion generally as an analgesic, it's not something I've been aware of. But in terms of talking about muscle damage and soreness in the days after, for some of the reasons we've talked about already in terms of limiting that inflammatory response, we know that when you have additional fluid in and around the muscle that isn't normally there, we have an increased stimulation of the mechanoreceptors in the muscle, and that can lead to an increased sensation of pain. So if you reduce the amount of fluid in the muscle by using some kind of cryotherapy intervention, you can potentially reduce those pain signals in the muscle because you don't have quite so much fluid. If you imagine, you know, filling up a balloon, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter, the more fluid is in there, and that acts as a stimulus in itself. Um, that signals to the brain that there is, you know, something wrong there, we're in discomfort. Okay. And we've all heard of these more far-reaching um, potential mechanisms that I think um, are worth discussing just because um, people will be curious about it. So we've all kind of heard about the hormonal um, response to cold therapy. Is this something that is there much research to back that up or where where do we stand with that? So in terms of hormonal responses, there's a couple of different things that have been looked at. And one of the key ones that comes up is increases in um, norepinephrine, so sometimes called noradrenaline. So this is essentially the um, sympathetic nervous system response to exercise. So it's things that will kind of increase heart rate, increase fat oxidation at high intensity exercise. And there have been some studies that show that we get an immediate increase um, in norepinephrine after cold exposure. Um, that said, that would happen if you were exposed to cold in any context. So it's not necessarily the intervention itself that, you know, there's anything special about a whole body cryotherapy chamber, for example. You would likely have the same effect if you went and stood outside on, you know, a very, very cold day, depending on where you are in the world. Um, it's fairly chilly over here today. So if I, you know, stood outside in minimal clothing for five minutes, I would probably get that same um, response in terms of hormone alterations. 
Yeah, um, I did that exact thing just before this podcast. I was like, oh, I need to fresh it up. So I went and stood outside in the freezing cold. But yeah. yeah. But that is another important aspect. You say that thing about freshening up. So there's a lot uh, of literature that talks about sort of perceptual and subjective responses to cold exposure. And a lot of athletes, and even from work I've done and, you know, having conversations with participants, they say, oh, you know, I, I just feel better. And they can't necessarily tell you why and they can't necessarily show you in terms of maybe functional performance, but they say, you know, they feel better, they feel refreshed. Um, if you ask them about their readiness to go back to training or readiness to go out and, you know, compete, they often say, well, yeah, I, j- I just feel better. I feel a bit more G'd up. And again, that might be because of that um, norepinephrine, because it has an effect on things like focus and mood. So again, those things can be really beneficial. And when we talked earlier about acute versus chronic exposure and when do you use it, if we're talking about athletes who maybe have um, compete in tournament scenarios, for example, where they're having to do multiple repetitions or multiple bouts of exercise over a short period of time, cryotherapy can be a really, really useful tool there because it helps you feel better in those short spaces where actually you might not have a huge amount of time to recover But because that's such a strong element, you know, that thing of my brain's telling me that actually I feel fine, that can kind of help you overcome some of the other, you know, functional deficits maybe because you will feel prepared and ready to go and you're not going out into your training or your competition thinking, oh, I feel a bit tired and a bit sluggish and a little bit sore. So that can be a really, really useful aspect for athletes. Yeah, and that personal experience, it reminds me of um, when I ran in college, we had an ice bath in our training room and there was people that swore by it and would be going in there you know after every hard workout and then there were people that just hated it they could not even if they thought it might um allow them to recover faster the experience was too stressful so it kind of brings it back to your point that um that stress response could be a positive thing for some people and uh, perhaps a negative thing for others yeah, I think I've, I've been asked a couple of times before about, you know, recommendations for athletes and would you do it and what would you suggest? And often it does come down to some extent to individual preference. As you say, um, doing the studies, you know, the one we're going to talk about a little bit more today and some of the other ones, a lot of athletes are like, yep, I love this. You know, I've done cold water swimming before or, you know, I've always wanted to try it and they really enjoy it. And like you said, they feel refreshed and revived. And there were some others that really, really struggled with it. They didn't really want to do it. Um, You know, when people signed up to join the study, they didn't necessarily know which group they would be in. So they didn't know what intervention they would be exposed to. Um, We did have a couple of people, you know, almost on the brink of tears when you're trying to get them into the ice bath. And like I said, we only went up to waist height. So it wasn't that they were going in up to the neck, but they just found it so uncomfortable. Some people find it quite painful. Um, me personally, when I, um, did a little dunk in the ice bath, I found that my feet were the worst bit. You have so little fat around your feet that actually that can be quite painful. So some people now, when they're doing kind of ice bath interventions, will sit with their feet propped out. So, you know, all of the kind of useful locomotor skeletal muscle, um, in the lower limbs will be submerged, but they'll either maybe put socks on, you know, you can get almost the Veruca socks. So the little rubber socks to keep your feet a little bit warmer or dry, or they'll just pop their feet out at the end because, the benefit of keeping your feet in is probably very, very minimal. But for some people, that's the worst part. So I always come back to say, if you hate cryotherapy, if you can't stand the thought of it, if you thought it makes you want to cry, the, any kind of performance benefit is probably not going to outweigh the discomfort and the stress response you're going to experience going in. So it very much does depend on whether you are a lover or a hater of those kinds of interventions. Yeah, definitely. And I'm sure that changes as well with um, your, like you said, your body mass or your fat percentage. Because I know that when I was leaner um, and likely unhealthier as a runner, I couldn't stand it. Whereas now I find like even going in the sea, uh, maybe at home in Scotland, I find it very refreshing and I love it. So yeah, like that, it could probably change as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There has been um, some research done to look at the relationship between responses to cryotherapy intervention and body composition variables. So again, something that hasn't necessarily been made really clear or explicit in the literature is, is there a best practice guideline based on body composition? So if we take into account an athlete's build and how much fat they're carrying and where they're carrying that fat – 
do we then alter the protocol that we use with them in order to bring about the most beneficial results? Um, obviously, the more adipose tissue, the more fat you have underlying the skin, the longer it's going to take to see a decrease in muscle temperature. But what you might find is actually skin temperature reduces very, very quickly because they have that buffer between the skin and the muscle underneath. So whereas in leaner people, you might find that actually the skin stays relatively warmer, but the muscle decreases in temperature more quickly because you don't have that level of fat underneath the skin to maintain heat. So yeah, that's something that as an individual, you might notice, as you say, if you've fluctuated from being leaner to being a little bit heavier, that actually the way you perceive that cold exposure will be different. So I think that's something that maybe is an area to explore further. And as with, you know, a lot of sports science research, there is relatively less research in women than men. And we know that body composition generally speaking, will differ between men and women in certain specific ways. One of those being that women will generally carry more fat. So whether they need to have slightly different protocols than men in order to get the same potential performance or perceptual benefits is something that might be useful to understand so that we can program for those individuals. Yeah, that's fascinating. The Referring to the um, epinephrine um, response, I read... I'm not sure if it was in your paper or not, but the parasympathetic reactivation and whether that has a role in improving sleep. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so there has been, again, um, cryotherapy has been in investigated in lots of different contexts. So as we're talking today, most of it is around sport and performance, but there has been lots of stuff around other areas such as weight loss and immune function and sleep. And there's a couple of different papers that have shown that exposure to cold can actually improve sleep quality and sleep parameters in healthy individuals. And as you said, it might be that it is that sort of parasympathetic reflex response to that increased heart rate, increased metabolism, other hormonal changes that we see that actually means that you end up with better sleep quality. So, um, the paper we're going to talk about today, we did actually look at sleep as a parameter. It's not included in the paper because the data at the end was incredibly messy and there wasn't really much we could get out of it. But we did have an idea that actually there was the potential that it would influence sleep, you know, quality or sleep duration. Um, and again, that's something that often now is included in studies, maybe not so much with the athletes specifically because the focus is still very much on performance. But as we all know, sleep is a key element and if that's not right in the first place you can have you know all the cutting edge technology you like but if you haven't got your sleep and nutrition sorted it can be difficult to then you know perform at your optimum so if there is uh, an additional benefit of cryotherapy for sleep that might be another consideration um, especially for athletes who maybe don't have good sleep patterns or good sleep hygiene um, already that could be another way that they could try and have a you know a drug-free approach to getting a better night's sleep yeah, definitely. So your paper, um, you were comparing whole body cryotherapy and ice baths. Yep. Could you give us an overview of um, that study, please? Sure. So this study was conducted as part of um, a slightly bigger project. And the overall idea was that at that time, there was very little information about the comparison between different cryotherapy modalities. As you mentioned, um, the idea of whole body cryotherapy was becoming more popular. Um, there was some articles starting to come out looking at, well, what is this? Uh, what is this method? You know, why might we use it? And a lot of people thinking that it was going to be better that, you know, if ice baths are good and they're quite cold, that a whole body cryotherapy intervention is going to be better because it's much colder. So what we were trying to do was directly compare the two different interventions um, and then trying to look relatively holistically at recovery. So again, a lot of the papers had focused on maybe one specific aspect. So whether that was functional recovery or perceptual recovery um, or looking at bloodborne markers that could indicate um, parameters of recovery or damage after exercise. So the idea with this paper was that we try and take that broad approach, look at a number of different areas related to recovery and see if we could find a difference of between those two, cold water and whole body cryotherapy, compared to a placebo intervention. Okay, and who were the participants in your study? 
So we recruited um, male participants who were regularly training and endurance trained. And one of the criteria was that they had to be able to complete a marathon distance in four and a half hours or less. The reason for that was just to try and standardise um, time under tension for the muscles. So, you know, for some people, if they were managing to do a two and a half hour marathon, their muscle damage response, irrespective of training, might be very different from someone who did a five hour marathon, for example. So um, all non-smokers, all healthy, um, no injuries, um, but they were not necessarily having to come from a club background. You know, a lot of them were just people who enjoyed going out running. We had some people who would compete fairly regularly, you know, be doing half marathons or marathons every other week. Um, So that was the group that we were targeting. Would you expect to see a difference between, say, your um, maybe a sub elite athletes and elite athletes in response to cryotherapy? Um, In response to cryotherapy, possibly. So for some of the reasons we mentioned previously, um, their experience with cryotherapy previously. So again, it might be that if we see adaptation to a cryotherapy intervention over time, if you don't change your protocol, you might find that any benefits become dulled over time. Um, In terms of difference in terms of the training status, if you like, or the competitive level, I wouldn't necessarily expect to see a huge difference in terms of the muscle damage responses and the symptoms outside of the individual variation you might expect to see between any two individuals who are given the same exercise protocol. Okay. And what were the variables then that you were measuring? So as I said, we looked at um, a couple of different areas. So We looked at muscle function. So in order to do that, we looked at peak torque. So that just basically means how much force can you generate about a particular joint? Uh, We focused obviously on the lower limb because we were using a running intervention. So we looked at um, the amount of force that you could generate in the quads and the hamstrings. We also looked at isometric contractions. So the peak torque is during movement. So torque is um, force also with direction. So we would get them to do knee extension and flexion. We looked at isometric contraction, so holding the lower limb in a fixed position and asked them to push against an immovable bar as hard as possible. Uh, We used drop jumps. So that's where you are, you know, stood on a box or a platform and you step down off that platform or box and you try and rebound off the floor. Reason for that is that it employs the stretch shortening cycle. So the idea of moving from one type of contraction to another. So you have the eccentric contraction on the way down as you're breaking and then you generate force for an uh, concentric contraction when you want to leave the floor. Um, All kinds of different vertical jumps are used across a huge number of studies looking at performance and recovery. So including that meant we could then hopefully make some comparisons to some of the other literature uh, in this area. We looked at muscle soreness. So again, a really, really common one. So one of the key things that athletes will talk about in terms of, you know, recovery and how they feel, it's often muscle soreness that we that we talk about. We used a really simple stress questionnaire. So looking at sources and symptoms of stress. And then we looked at a couple of different blood markers that related to structural damage. So trying to get a gauge of how much damage had occurred. And then also a couple of different markers to look at inflammation. When did you measure these? So for most of them, well, for all of them, we measured them at baseline. And then the way that we measured them after exercise differed slightly depending uh, on the marker. So we looked at all of the muscle function before the marathon. And then we looked at 24 and 48 hours post. For um, the soreness and the stress questionnaire, we also did the same. So pre-run 24 and 48 hours. For the blood markers, it got a little bit more complicated. And part of that was because the time course of change for those markers is different. So not all of the inflammatory markers, you would expect to see um, the peaks at the same time points. So we looked at um, CRP or C-reactive protein. We looked at IL-6, interleukin-6, and we looked at TNF-alpha or tumor necrosis factor alpha. So IL-6 is the fastest acting of those inflammatory markers. We tend to see peaks uh, within maybe six hours of exercise. So that one we did before they did the run, immediately after their recovery intervention. So whether that was cold water, whole body cryotherapy or the placebo. And then we did it again at 24 hours post. We didn't expect to see anything change really much after those 24 hours. For CRP and TNF-alpha, we again did baseline 
um, 24 and 48. We also did an immediately post for that TNF alpha. And then for the creatine kinase, so this is the intracellular protein. So basically it's a protein that normally sits within the cell walls in the muscle. And then when we damage those cells, it gets out into the bloodstream and you get um, an increase in um, the bloodstream. So CK was done at baseline. So again, before the run and 24 and 48 hours post. Okay, great. And so you had them run the marathon. And well, so you tested them, as you said, um, like take their baseline measurements and you had them run the marathon. And did you do, did the participants then do the ice baths and, or ice bath or whole body cryotherapy? What, how long after um, the marathon? Yeah. So after they'd completed the marathon, um, they would then within 15 minutes of completion. So the time it took to get them, you know, from outside back up into the lab or back into the chamber, they would then do their recovery intervention. So that would, like I said, be the cold water immersion, the whole body cryotherapy or the placebo. Um, and then they would have their blood sample taken immediately after their recovery intervention had finished. So we could do the IL-6 um, and the TNF alpha. And then they would all come back one day and two days post, so 24 and 48 hours. And then we would repeat all of those dependent variables again. And is the sooner the better with getting into the ice bath or the whole body cryotherapy? Yeah, so most of the literature indicates that the sooner you can um, use those interventions, the better. So in terms of muscle damage and that inflammatory response that I talked about, that begins as soon as you start exercising, really. So by the time they'd finished the marathon, you know, some of them might have been, you know, three and a half, four, four and a quarter hours into that inflammatory response. So the sooner you can apply that intervention, the better. Um, there was some research done a number of years ago, and they looked at the difference between um, using cryotherapy immediately post and 24 hours post. And when they used it at 24 hours, there was essentially no benefit or no effect because by that point, you've missed your chance to try and attenuate some of those symptoms we talked about before. So like I said, the inflammation and the soreness. So yeah, the sooner you can do it after exercise, the better. Although we do know that in reality, that's often difficult for athletes. So depending on where they are, you know, what the competition is, depending on the level of the athlete, we know that often they might have things like media responsibilities. They might have to go and talk to people after their event, after their race. Um, they may have to you know, travel from a competition site back to where they're staying or back to a training camp. So all of those things can impact how quickly that can be done. But in um, a perfect world, you would do it as soon as possible after you finished exercise. Yeah. And you had a placebo, is that right? Yep. So... Um, this was an aspect that I think was relatively novel for cryotherapy um, research at the time. And the reason for that was we know that there is um, a placebo effect. So basically a placebo intervention is an intervention whereby you don't expect to have any kind of therapeutic benefit. So um, if we talk about medical research, they will nearly always have a treatment and a control but because we know that if we tell someone, you know, you're ill, but you're not getting any treatment at all, they're unlikely to feel better on their own. But if we tell them you're ill and I'm going to give you a pill that will make you feel better, sometimes even if there's no medicine in that pill, it has a psychological benefit and they will actually start to feel better. So with um, cryotherapy, there had been a suggestion that a lot of the benefits were just related to sort of perceptual responses and a belief that it was doing some good. So if we compared individuals who were doing the cryo interventions to individuals who just did nothing, we thought there would likely be an effect in the results because those people who are doing nothing are going to know they're doing nothing. You know, we're not able to tell them they're in an ice bath when they're actually not. It's not as easy to blind someone to their intervention when you're looking at immersion protocols. So the placebo for that first study, we decided to tell the participants that they were taking a cherry juice supplement. Um, the reason we picked a cherry juice supplement was because there had been a lot of literature done already on um, cherry juice and looking at it as a nutritional intervention after different types of exercise. And there had been really positive findings um, after marathons and endurance exercise. So if we gave those participants a placebo, told them it was cherry juice, we hoped that across all participants, there would be a relatively equal level of treatment belief or expectation that the treatment would work. So what we were hoping then to identify was whether 
the cryotherapy interventions were any more effective than a plus, than a well um, implemented placebo. Yeah, it's hard to um, find a placebo quite as strong as uh, let's say cryotherapy because there's such. I'm sure, like it feels severe. You know, you you it feels like something is definitely happening to my body. So I'd imagine. Um, it is quite a hard thing to uh, measure a true placebo effect. Yeah, I think it's definitely hard to implement. I think that is a limitation with any of you know these kinds of studies. There are other researchers who have tried to use different kinds of placebos before. So there are um, interventions where they've used a thermoneutral water immersion. So the idea that um, you still have the potential benefit of the immersion itself. So in the literature, we talk sometimes about hydrostatic pressure and the effect that can have on things like um, venous return and blood flow. So the idea that if you are immersed in water, you have that pressure of water acting on the body and that can affect blood flow. So some studies looked at, well, is the benefit coming from the immersion or is the benefit coming from the temperature? So there are some studies that have looked at a cold intervention and then a thermoneutral water intervention. So again, I don't suppose the participants in that study were completely blinded, um, double blinded. They would have known if they were in the cold or the thermoneutral, but at least those participants in the thermoneutral intervention would know they were doing something and that it had the potential to, you know, to improve recovery or improve perceptions of recovery. So that's one way that some people have gone about it. Um, We decided to use a different type of placebo, but as you say, um, whether the physical act of getting into that ice bath, spending time in it is enough of a um, kind of a psychological event, if you like. And maybe we can't match that with something else. Um, but for though, the placebo group, we mimicked a dosing strategy that had been used in a previous intervention. So instead of it just being a one off, you know, you come in, you take a pill or you have a drink and you're done. Those in the cryotherapy, uh, sorry, in the placebo group actually supplemented for a number of days. So in that sense, it was like it was something that was sustained over five days prior to the marathon, the day of and then the two days after. So because it was a little bit more involved in what they had to do, hopefully that they had that feeling of I'm I'm doing something, you know, I'm putting an intervention in place and, you know, it's taken me eight days to do it. I'm having to measure out my doses and take them twice a day. So one limitation with us is that we didn't ask any questions at the end about whether they expected their particular treatments to work or whether they had any idea of, you know, whether one was more effective than another. But just from talking to the participants, even those who were on the placebo, I had a couple come and say to me like, oh, I really enjoyed doing that cherry juice and I quite like it. I might I might get some after the study. Um, so my hope is that there was a roughly equal level of treatment, belief or expectation, but I can't say that. Um, with any real certainty unfortunately in this case yeah definitely um so what did you find what were the results so um our results were actually slightly contrasting compared to some of the other literature and some of the other papers that had come out um we found that for the functional responses so for things like the force generation and the the jump parameters that the whole body cryotherapy group um, had the least good response, if you like. So they were the worst in terms of their recovery. Um, The whole body cryotherapy was maybe the worst, then cold water immersion, then placebo. So the placebo group actually showed the better recovery over time compared to the other two groups. And one of the reasons we said this might be was that um, for this particular intervention, we used an eight degree water immersion temperature At the time, that had been used in a number of other studies. There were some that had done eight, some that had done 10, some that had done 12. We decided to go for the eight. And as we were going through the data collection and the write-up of this study, there were some papers that came out and suggested that um, temperatures below maybe 10 degrees end up being an additional cold shock that can trigger its own stress response. So one of the suggestions maybe was that actually by being exposed to these very, very cold temperatures in the whole body cryotherapy chamber and in the cold water immersion group, that in addition to the stress response caused by the exercise itself, that maybe the intervention had exacerbated that further. And that was one potential suggestion as to why we might have seen those results um, 
for our part- for our participants. In terms of the perceptual stuff, so this is where maybe I was a little bit more surprised. So a lot of the previous research said, you know, for soreness, it's great. We love cryotherapy. Lots of people feel really, really good after it and you get really positive responses. Um, we did find that the whole body cryotherapy and the cold water immersion groups fared slightly better on the soreness scores than the placebo group, but it wasn't statistically significant. So in terms of um, performance and real world practice, it might be that there is a benefit there, but statistically speaking, that wasn't really evident from the findings. And again, we found that the DALDA questionnaire, so that stress questionnaire, we had slightly better scores in the whole body cryotherapy group. And that could link back to what we talked about earlier, that idea of boosting that norepinephrine and the kind of the mood response and that feeling of, oh, actually, you know, I'm ready to go and I feel better. So in terms of their sources and symptoms of stress, that might have been why they fared slightly better. Um, Wow. Was that um, the eight degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit? Celsius. Sorry, I should have clarified. Yeah. Yeah. So eight degrees plus or minus about half a degree. Okay. Great. Thanks. So, wow. So those were, in some ways, were they, were they, how did those results compare to your expectations then? So I tried to be um, fairly unbiased going into it. Um, As I said, I, I know there was a lot of literature suggesting that whole body cryotherapy was this new jazzy technology and that everyone should do it because it's great. So I thought that there might be some really good perceptual responses In terms of the um, functional data, I think it wasn't a huge surprise um, because there is still relatively little data to support the use of cryotherapy to enhance functional recovery after exercise. It's still an area that's being investigated and there's a lot of literature now sort of delving into the mechanistic reasons behind that. But the fact that we didn't see that either of the cryotherapy interventions was any better than the placebo wasn't a huge surprise. Um, but also it could be because of the type of exercise intervention that we use. So it might be that in marathon runners, which is obviously who we used in this study, there was not a huge beneficial effect, but maybe for other types of exercise, we might find that the cryotherapy is actually more useful or more beneficial than a placebo. And our listeners are mostly cyclists um, and some triathletes. Would you expect that to be similar across endurance sports or um, do you think there would be a difference between cyclists say, and runners? So um, I mentioned at the beginning about different types of muscle damage and where muscle damage can kind of stem from. So most exercise modalities are a mixture of mechanical and metabolic damage. Um, We tend to find high levels of metabolic damage in cyclists. So for your cyclists and your triathletes, you might find that the type of exercise stress does differ. And because of that, the way that cryotherapy might attenuate your symptoms might also be different. Um, There has been a lot more research done recently in cyclists and looking at the effects of cryotherapy and particularly looking at the effects of chronic use of cryotherapy. And actually, a lot of them have found that cryotherapy can enhance performance um, in endurance athletes and cyclists particularly uh, when it's used as a kind of chronic addition to training Um, and the reason behind that is because we know that exposure to cold can increase um, the activity of pgc1 alpha which is a kind of a key mediator of mitochondrial biogenesis so the idea that we can increase mitochondria in the muscle and for endurance athletes that's massively important because if everyone remembers back to being in school, we talk about the powerhouse of the cell. Increase in mitochondria means increase in um, aerobic enzyme activity and potentially increase in endurance performance. So if they're being chronically exposed to cold temperatures and they're doing that in combination with aerobic and endurance training, which would naturally bring about those kinds of adaptations, it seems that there is an additive effect. So actually for endurance athletes, irrespective of the the short-term recovery, it might be that actually longer term, if you're looking at um, performance and training adaptations over time, cryotherapy could be a really useful tool. Okay, so based on these results though, is it worth spending our money um, going into whole body cryotherapy chambers? Based off of this study, um, and obviously I say 
there are caveats with everything. I wouldn't recommend necessarily that athletes pursue whole body cryotherapy chambers if they are individuals who like cryotherapy exposure, if they find that, you know, it's an intervention that they get along with. There doesn't seem to be any benefit of using whole body cryotherapy over and above what you might expect using a less expensive and more accessible option like cold water immersion. So for any of your listeners who are interested in this as, you know, a potential addition to their normal training program, I would suggest that they seek out cold water immersion instead. And that can be as low tech or as high tech as you want. So as we said before, there's, you know, pictures all over the newspapers whenever it's, um, you know, Six Nations time or when we have, you know, big football competitions and it might be the players in bins, literal, you know, rubbish bins like biffer bins and they're filled with water and ice. Um, People can do it in hotel rooms, you know, at training camps. They can use their bath, fill that up with ice and water. Or again, if they are lucky enough to have access to a fixed unit. So if you have a built-in ice bath or chiller unit, you can then have a little bit more control over your temperatures, but the effects will be the same. Yeah, definitely. So it sounds like there's so many potential mechanisms with um, the cryotherapy. And there's a lot, like you said, like the mitochondrial biogenesis um, with long-term use or chronic use could be um, potentially beneficial to performance. But then we also discussed earlier about it blunting adaptations potentially. So I think that kind of leads me to um, our listeners' questions here that they um, submitted over Instagram. And um, someone said, if it makes me feel good to take cold showers um, and ice baths, would you say just to crack on with it? Yeah. So one thing I will say um, in terms of the acute versus chronic argument and the adaptation is that as more and more research is being produced, what we're tending to see is that for endurance athletes, it's a either no difference or positive. Whereas for resistance trained athletes, that's where we tend to see the adaptation blunting and where we might actually expect that it would be detrimental to long term performance. So given that the vast majority of your listeners are likely to be endurance athletes and interested in endurance training and performance, if you like cold showers, if they make you feel better, if you feel refreshed, absolutely do crack on. Yep, I wouldn't suggest that you stop it. Um, Flip side to that being, if you are someone who hates them, it might be that actually this isn't the intervention for you and there's something else you can be doing that will help enhance your performance. So yeah, if you enjoy it and you're happy and you've got access, then by all means, carry on. As I said, it might be that in the very short term, you might not see any particular recovery benefits, but as a longer term intervention, you might find that it can help increase those aerobic adaptations. Yeah, definitely. And some of these we've, we've somewhat um, touched upon, but we'll, we'll ask you them anyway. Um, for Is there a potential use for cryotherapy immediately prior to exercise? Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, the reason that you would do it before exercise is different than the reason you would use it after. So if you're thinking to use pre-cooling, and a lot of athletes do this, you're going to be using it because what you want to do is attenuate increases in body temperature or core temperature. So we know that during exercise, body temperature will increase. And we know that your brain has a very sensitive shut-off switch. So if you start to get up towards temperatures that are dangerous, that could impair um, you know, your physical health, you will not be able to maintain exercise normally over, above and beyond that point. So the reason you might be using cryotherapy before exercise is to bring down your starting point in terms of body temperature. So what that means is hopefully you can exercise for a longer period of time or at a higher intensity before you get those increases in body temperature that would then lead to you having to stop exercise. Um, So, yeah, there is absolutely scope to do that. Um, There are lots and lots of different ways that cryotherapy is used uh, before exercise. So things like ingestion of ice slurries, using things like ice vests, ice collars. Uh, Again, it's all about cooling the blood that's going around the brain, because if your brain doesn't know that the rest of you is really hot, it will still let you continue exercising. So, yeah, that's um, one of the ways that it's used that isn't focused specifically on recovery. But again, it might you might find that using it pre-exercise reduces um, the recovery time you need because if you don't have that increase in temperature, that increase in enzyme activity that can start that cascade of um, 
you know, reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, you might find that you actually um, experience less damage as a result, less metabolic damage, at least as a result. So that could then help you feel better afterwards, even if you don't use the cryotherapy post-exercise as well. Interesting. Yeah. Cause the only race that I ever, uh, didn't finish was, um, when it was 85 degrees Fahrenheit and it was just simply the heat was just unbearable. So yeah, it could like ultimately allow you to finish a race, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, particularly with the understanding that global temperatures are rising, you know, a lot of the big competitions, we see lots of stuff in the media about the risk to athletes because of increased environmental temperatures. So a lot of, um, kind of football tournaments, things like, you know, the Australian Open for tennis, um, the Olympics, you know, the last couple of cycles for the Olympics, there's been a lot of concern from the IOC around dealing with um, increased temperatures. And that's one of the things where cryotherapy will really come to the fore because it has that potential protective effect and it can be implemented in lots and lots of different ways. So yeah, there's absolutely scope there to, to use it as a protective mechanism rather than a recovery mechanism, or you can do both. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So if you're going to do um, cryotherapy for just general health and well-being, is there a best time of day to do it? Um, I don't think there is a best time of day. And again, it comes down really to kind of individual preference and individual um, accessibility to it. Um, we know that body temperature fluctuates throughout the day anyway. So um, the way you experience cryotherapy might differ slightly between, you know, different times of day. So if you're going into um, cryotherapy when, you, you know, your body temperature is naturally at its lowest, what you might find is that the skin, core and muscle temperature decreases end up taking you to a slightly lower level. But I think, again, it depends on what works for you. I think the difference in benefit between different times of the day is negligible compared to the difference between doing it or not doing it. So if you can fit it in, whenever you can fit it in and you enjoy it, then go for it. Great, yeah. And how do cold showers compare to um, cold baths or plunges, as we're seeing more of? Um, so the mechanisms behind them in terms of um, exposure to cold are exactly the same. The difference between maybe a cold plunge or a bath compared to a shower is obviously the consistent exposure. So if you're in the shower, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to cover all of your skin all of the time with that cold water. And again, um, you might find that, you know, the temperature might fluctuate. It might be a little bit more difficult to control. Whereas with a plunge pool or in an ice bath, you know that for the entire time that you're in it, all of that skin whether you're immersed up to your waist, up to your chest, up to your neck, all of that skin is then exposed to the cold. So um, the overall load, if you like, the overall treatment load is likely to be slightly greater. But again, that said, if you don't have access to a bath or a cold bath specifically, if you, you know, like me, I live in a flat, we have a shower, not a bath. So if that is your only option, again, doing it versus not doing it, the difference is still greater than doing it with a shower versus doing it with a cold bath. So there absolutely is a place for it. And again, it might mean it's much more accessible for certain individuals, depending on the type of sport, depending on the type of place that you train. Um, if you're going somewhere that has changing facilities, you're likely to be able to get access to a shower, but you're probably not going to get access to a bath. So if the difference between using the shower facilities at your club, for example, versus waiting until you've driven home, got changed, sorted your tea out and got in the bath at home, you're probably still better off using the shower because you will get some benefit conferred with that cold exposure. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So if you're someone um, who is potentially a little bit scared of the cold water or the idea of it, what about, is there a place for contrast? So hot between going between hot and cold? Yes, yeah, so that's another area where there is um, a fair bit of research and it's something that is still being investigated. Um, the idea is that obviously you're switching between temperatures and that can you know, bring its own benefits. If you're scared of the cold water um, and you don't like it, you can do contrast bathing or you can just do um, exposures where you do small amounts of time in, but then you come out and we call it a rewarming period and then you go back in. So one of the things with um, 
cold water immersion or whole body cryotherapy is that we want to avoid any damage to the skin. You know, we want to avoid the skin getting super cold because you can end up getting sort of freeze burns and that kind of thing. But one way to protect against that is to go into the cold for two, three minutes, come out and then go back in. And what happens is it means it gives the chance for the skin to rewarm, but you don't get the same rewarming at the muscle level. So if you do that, it means you can actually potentially achieve lower muscle temperatures without having to get to really, really low skin temperatures. Um, the effect of doing the hot and cold, uh, it's probably the same idea in that you'll you'll warm the skin very, very quickly, but you probably won't get to the point where the muscle will start to rewarm or you won't get to the point where you're, you're not losing heat from the muscle still before you get back in the cold water. So again, that is another option. Um, logistically that can be a little bit more difficult again if you have access to a shower and the temperature is quite sensitive to change and you can do it that way or you know i've seen people before where they have showers in change rooms have one one side cold one one side hot and they just go between the two um but yeah that is absolutely another um immersion technique that a lot of athletes use and utilize and some of them prefer it because you do have that almost relief of getting into the warm in between those little cold bouts yeah, definitely. I quite like that myself because <laughs> I'm a wimp. Um, thank you so much for answering all of our questions, Dr. Wilson. What is there anything, what's your, what are you most curious about to explore with regards to cryotherapy um, moving forward? I think one thing I'm still really keen on is understanding that really individualized experience. So, as I said, understanding a little bit more about how the responses differ for different individuals. So whether that's based on things like body composition, whether that's based on things like um, your age, your sex, your um, competitive level, for example. And the idea of maybe trying to understand if we can come up with some kind of equation or some kind of um, way that we can individualize treatments for different people so that Ideally, we end up with a really tailored approach. Um, there's been a few different papers come out saying we know it's not one size fits all, but we don't yet know how to individualise it further. So I think that's something that I'm going to still try and pursue to try and make sure that for those that want to use it and for those where there is a clear potential for benefit, we can optimise it as much as possible. Great. We'd, uh, be, we'd love to have you back on to discuss that if you're open to it. Where can we keep up to date with your work? So you can keep up to date with my work on Twitter, on ResearchGate, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, so I can share any of those links or details if anyone would like to come and have a chat, say hello, or ask any other questions, do feel free to give me a shout. Great, we'll ask Maxine to include them in the show notes then. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much. It was lovely to speak to you. <laughs>